What's up everyone, I am in Maniac and this is Head to Head, the interview show bringing you some of the biggest names in the gaming world. Today I am excited to have a very special guest. If you're into the PC side of gaming, especially StarCraft, there's a chance you may have heard of him. He is ACL StarCraft admin and manager of the StarCraft 2 team NVIDIA, Docs. Welcome to the show man, how are you? Yeah man, doing pretty well, thank you. That's the way. I'm very glad to have you here, mate. Um, basically, I thought I'd get you on the show, mate, to introduce, well, basically introduce you to the wider community, not just ACL people, but anyone who doesn't exactly know who Docs is or don't know much about the StarCraft 2 scene in general, because myself as a console gamer, uh, I know a lot of friends and even myself, our StarCraft 2 knowledge, our PC gaming knowledge is <laughs> extremely lacking. <laughs> it's in some ways... <laughs> embarrassing embarrassing levels of of uh lacking knowledge so uh if you could docs could you just give us uh, a bit of an introduction to yourself um and basically how you got to where you are in acl now yeah well uh my name is derek i'm a 27 year old esports fanatic from brisbane australia originally currently residing in melbourne i've um i've been working in the so-called esports industry for about 11 years now i originally started uh with the world cyber games challenge in 2000 so it's been a pretty long ride. I've um, primarily been focused around the PC titles. I had a lot of involvement in uh, some of the WCG titles, such as uh, StarCraft Brood War, uh, Counter-Strike, a little bit of Quake, mostly Unreal Tournament, um, Warcraft 3 primarily, and of course now StarCraft 2 as well. Uh, and a tiny little bit of Halo. It's, it's actually quite funny. Myself and Vans had a bit of a history about six or seven years ago. We came across each other's paths and uh, didn't realize who we, who we were until we met again six years later. So it was quite funny. Really? I never knew about that. You'd ha- you have to <laughs> expand a little bit on that, Docs. Well, we were both playing in a... Um, uh, what was it? It was the Cyber Shack Halo tournament in Sydney at iStar Zone, which was the internet cafe that I was managing at the time. Right. Um, I think it was 2005. And okay. yeah, we're both participating in that. And I was I was hosting it. I was uh, part of the CBN team that was running the event. So I thought I'd just sign up for uh, for a bit of a laugh. But yeah, I managed to meet the guy back then. And here we are now, six years later, thinking back, being like, ah, you were that guy. <laughs> so it's a uh, very small world, very small industry. <laughs> yeah, amazingly small world, especially in esports. Right, yeah. so it's pretty fair to say from that background that you've got an extensive history in PC gaming. So... Look, let's get on to, I think, which would be the central hub of esports, not only in now becoming in Australia, but also the world, which is StarCraft. So, look, let's go, just for the for the noobs of us out there, let's go through the StarCraft basics. Uh, if you could just summarise the game of StarCraft and, and what makes StarCraft docs. Mm, well, I'd have to say StarCraft is a it's a fast-paced, real-time strategy game designed by uh, Blizzard Entertainment. They're pretty popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and it demands a, I guess you could say, a strong balance of unit control, or what we call micromanagement, and economy management, which is uh, something we call macro. So uh, it kind of re- relies on your ability to do pretty, I, could say, I guess you could say, complex or sophisticated tasks simultaneously. And as you continue to grow in the game and as a player, uh, you notice this balance of these two different abilities simultaneously climbing. And a lot of players are defined by their ability to prominently exceed at one or the other. But uh, the true masters are the ones that can do both. Right, understandable. So multitasking is definitely a priority. So does that mean we're going to see a a lot of females in the competitive league, seeing the whole (laughs) multitasking little stereotype there? (laughs) Well, you'd think so. I mean, there's actually quite a few successful female players out there, but given the, I guess you could say, the traditional gaming stigma, they're still quite the minority. So they're becoming more and more popular overseas in events like MLG, but Mm -hmm. at this stage it seems that the traditional stigma of the... uh, the, I guess you could say the teenage or middle-aged uh, male gaming nerd is sticking around for quite a while. <laughs> right, <laughs> fair enough. All right, so look, everyone, even though they may not know anything about StarCraft, surely everyone has heard about it. We've all heard about it. None of us may not know what GSL is, but we sure have heard of it. We've heard names like Boxer and MVP and all of these names thrown around. What is it and why is StarCraft so popular in the esports world? Well, I guess it kind of comes down to two reasons, well, two primary reasons. I'd say the first one is simply because the game is really approachable. It's really simple and really easy to get started, and it has a really fascinating learning curve, which I was kind of touching on before, which uh, kind of allows players to measure themselves against their peers as they improve, Mm 
Mm-hmm. So it's not just like this this game where you're in a diluted pool of just thousands or millions of players and you don't really know where you stand. It's very easy to understand exactly how good you are compared to the rest of the world when you're playing StarCraft, uh, which I think is a, a pretty, you know, a great uh, goal that Blizzard has achieved with StarCraft. Yeah. And I guess, secondly, uh, I'd have to say the personalities. I mean, there's so many big figures in the community, like uh, Day9, Tasteless, Artosis. I mean, these are all names that you would have heard along with Boxer and MVP and all those guys. And they just make the entire scene, all of the, the spectatorship, so much more enjoyable. Right. So what, what's the scene actually like? For those of us who haven't had much to do with the StarCraft scene, like, we have, like, surely some of us have heard some of those names. If you could, how would you describe the scene? What's it like? And what are the major communities throughout Australia and the world? Well, the scene has actually uh, really been booming throughout 2011. I would have to say 2011 was probably the biggest sports for, uh, sorry, the biggest year for esports overall. Uh, we saw like unprecedented growth, and I don't think anyone really anticipated what happened last year. Uh, people knew that StarCraft II was coming out in 2010, and they expected, yeah, this is going to be cool. It'll continue on the tradition of Brood War. Some people will switch over from uh, traditional StarCraft, some people won't. But the level at which it grew and expanded and attracted the world has just been never seen before, and it's been amazing. Um, and as far as communities and tournaments and stuff goes, uh, I mean, ACL Pro, obviously the, the major candidate for the Australian side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, across in America, you've got MLG and the North American Star League. Those are the two prominent ones over there. Mm-hmm. Um, IEM, the Intel Extreme Masters, kind of operates around the world. So they, uh, they attract a lot of attention from uh, the Koreans, the Europeans, and the Americans, and a little bit from the Southeast Asian side. We've had some of our guys go over there a few times. Mm-hmm. And they kind of host their events back and forth across the, the shores from, you know, from China to New York to Germany and all over the place. So IEM is actually one of my personal favorites because it is just so, I guess you could say, intercontinental. Right. Um, and of course, everyone knows about the GSL, which is, you know, the premier league uh, currently residing in Korea at the moment. Right. So if I could, I'd like to expand a little bit on GSL because I think if, if anyone's heard of a StarCraft league, it's probably the GSL. So... Um, if you could just elaborate a little more on, on what the GSL actually is, like as an example, I've I've seen some pictures where there's full size stadiums packed out with these these StarCraft gamers, you know, just duking it out. Uh, so yeah, could you just elaborate a bit on GSL and uh, what's its place in the StarCraft scene? Well, I guess you could say the GSL is absolutely the premier league of the world. It it hosts all of the best players, uh, most of them, of course, South Korean. Uh, we do see some of the Americans and Europeans and even some Australians flying over there to, to take a shot at uh, the GSL titles. But generally, it's it's more often that we see the Koreans coming out on top. And it's been uh, it's been built on the foundations of what uh, had started in Brood War. I mean, it's it's been 11 years in the making with, uh, with StarCraft 1 and Brood War really igniting the pro scene in Korea. And from there, we saw the, uh, I guess you could say, the amalgamation of sponsors and pro team houses and coaches and all these new elements that had never really been a big part of esports in the past. Right. Everything just kind of started snowballing together to create this massive phenomenon in Korea. And now it's almost uh, regarded as a national sport. It's that big. Right. Does it look like it's slowing down anytime soon? Absolutely not, man. I mean, <laughs> it was looking a little bit shaky uh, towards the end of 2011 because at that stage, there is only really one big prominent league happening in South Korea, and people were thinking, okay, well, this, this league is doing great, but you need more than that for the scene to grow. You can't just have one big league. Um, and it was revealed about, I'd say, I think three weeks ago that uh, the guys that were in charge of broadcasting all of the traditional Brood War stuff in mm-hmm. South Korea are now coming on board. So we're going to have a lot more interesting content coming from South Korea in the near future. And I mean, having leagues competing and you know uniting players, it certainly does good things for the growth of the sport. Awesome. So you spoke about um, all of these players flying out to GSL and, and, and obviously uh, players from the GSL flying out as well. Who are the players to look out for, first of all, internationally, and then who can we look for as in regards to homegrown talent? You know, internationally, it's it's actually hard to say. A lot of people would say that there are a lot of flavor of the month players. There's the, uh, the consistent guys like MC or MVP, Nesty, all of the household names that you hear for so long, who just consistently tend to perform, tend to make their way into the finals and even take out multiple championships. And then there's the other guys who people quickly regard as an up-and-comer one day and then a world champion the next day. Uh, And we just see so many of those because 
I guess you could say the scene is so volatile. There are people who have the ability to go to the top, but they don't really get that opportunity to demonstrate it because for one reason or another, uh, they lose a single series in a best of three and all of a sudden they're eliminated and they don't get to really showcase what they're capable of for another two or three months. Right. So this is uh, kind of one of the reasons why the globalization of esports has been so important because it allows these players to attend multiple events around the world and showcase exactly what they are uh, good at. Right. So, I mean, we've seen uh, so many players, like, I mean, just off the top of my head, we've got people like Puma, who came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden he just, like, won the NASL, and he was just a world-renowned player for joining EG and suddenly being, you know, worth something. Uh, you got people like Lenok from FXO, who just, again, came out of nowhere and started winning championships. Um, Dongregu, I mean, there's just so many. that It would take, like, literally, like, an hour to list them all. There's <laughs> so much talent out there. Right. And how about uh, the homegrown talent? Like, we've uh, heard, like, as an example, we've heard of, of Moonglade and, and the Pinners. Is there, who are the names that you would point out to, to look out for in uh, Australian competition and in future ACL tournaments? Well, I guess to begin with, i got to say the beauty of the Australian scene is that everyone is actually really closely matched. I mean, historically, Moonglade has come out on top more often than not, but the uh, the skill level between him and all of his rivals in Australia is very very close. I mean, you've got players like if we just look at the Zerg roster, you've got Mafia from Zeria Gaming, you've got Pig representing TT Esports, mm -hmm. uh, you've got people like T Gun uh, representing a, an international team, Gosu. You got mm -hmm. uh, a Norwegian player who's living in Australia by the name of Targa. He's just on fire lately. Uh, and then if you start looking at the Terrans, there are people like Rossi, Death, YJ, Iagus. There are just so many really good Terran players, it's scary. Um, and then in the Protoss department, you know, it, it's kind of historically been the least or the uh, lowest representation in our region. But mm -hmm. they're really starting to, to cause some sparks lately. And you've got people like uh, Light, again from Zaria Gaming. You've got Pinda. You've got Yang. Uh, who else we have? We have Sensei up in Queensland. There's a lot of really good Protoss talent. Who were just starting to make that move, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we had a major upset and saw a Protoss take out ACL Sydney. Awesome, exciting stuff. So, with all of these players, Docs, do we see any of these players going and being involved in these international competitions, such as GSL or the likes of MLG? Or